Hello, my name is Edith de Guzman and I'm director and co-founder of the Los Angeles Urban Cooling Collaborative. It's my pleasure to join a group of accomplished tutors in this masterclass series on understanding, modeling, and mitigating urban heat. Over the next few minutes, I will share a case study from Los Angeles, looking at how to reduce heat vulnerability using land cover interventions. The reality in Los Angeles, and perhaps where you live as well, is that many residents live in highly urbanized neighborhoods with a preponderance of heat retaining built surfaces and with limited vegetation to provide shade and evaporative cooling. This is a photo of a tree planted near a bus stop here in LA. It shows a space loving ficus planted in too small a tree well and its branches are pruned so poorly that all we see are some tufts of leaves that create almost no shade for pedestrians or bus riders. Instead of tangible benefits, ironically, we have a large mural paying homage to the beauty of a tree, which may provide aesthetic benefit, but unfortunately provides no shade or cooling. What would happen if we improved these urban conditions and began to treat green and reflective surfaces as the life-saving assets that they are? We'll explore this during the presentation. LA is one of the mega cities of the world. Our, our county has 10 million residents and is extremely diverse. There are massive disparities in wealth, which means some Angelinos have access to coping strategies to deal with the heat, while others do not. Our region has a Mediterranean climate with cool, wet winters and hot, dry summers, and we occasionally even have winter heat waves that lead to heat-related illness and death in the months of January and February. Though we're accustomed to heat waves that push temperatures into the 90s and 100s Fahrenheit, like other regions, we're warming more quickly than the adaptation acts, actions that are necessary to deal with these changes. Last September, we hit the highest ever recorded temperature in the county, 121 degrees Fahrenheit, about 50 degrees C. In considering how to adapt to heat, our varied topography and ecosystems mean that one size does not fit all. Approaches that might work for coastal neighborhoods differ from those that might work in valleys, foothills, or mountain communities. Take a look at this drone footage of two LA neighborhoods and note the difference in green cover and heat retaining surfaces. The socio-ecological and economic diversity of our region means that in Los Angeles, where you live impacts how much exposure you will have to heat and what amenities will be available for you to deal with heat waves. Boyle Heights on the left side of the screen is in a heavily urbanized part of the city with 94% Latino residents, many of whom live under the poverty line. On the right, Brentwood is a predominantly white neighborhood with household incomes over 100,000 a year. The same heat wave here will impact these two communities very differently. At this point, I'd like to ask you all a question and I'll, I'll give our hosts just a moment to uh, set up the Mentimeter code that you will need in order to participate. Thinking about where you live in your city or town, what are some reasons that some neighborhoods have more tree cover than others? Why do some neighborhoods have more heat retaining surfaces than others? Please enter your response and we'll review everybody's responses at the end of the presentation. Um, as you consider the reasons, you might think about socioeconomics, patterns of development, existing or historical policies, cultural preferences, and physical factors like topography and ecological conditions. So now that we've covered a bit of the context about the issue and some of the relevant factors, let's talk about solutions. I've been fortunate to be part of a group of researchers and practitioners who set out to explore the potential of reducing public health impacts of urban heat through land cover modifications. We founded the Los Angeles Urban Cooling Collaborative in 2015, which has representation from academia, nonprofit organizations, and government. And it's really a national collaborative with partners in all parts of the US focused on piloting new approaches in LA and sharing our process with other regions. We received funding from the USDA Forest Service and Harvard Westlake School, which enabled us to tackle the study you'll now hear about. 
The project team included expertise in areas such as forestry, cool city technologies, policy, public health and medicine, bioclimatology, meteorology, anthropology, and geography. In this recent work, we tested several prescriptions, as we like to call them. Prescriptions of tree cover and solar reflectance, also known as albedo, of roofs and pavements. We used historical weather data and public health data and modeled how these prescriptions would impact temperature, humidity, human mortality, and air masses, which I'll explain more shortly. We also projected how these prescriptions would perform under future climate conditions. Now let me pause for a moment and explain a little bit about the issue of heat-related health outcomes. Mortality refers to deaths, which oftentimes are not reported as heat-related. We use the measure of excess deaths to account for this, which are deaths above and beyond those that are expected in a given geographic area for a specific time period based on historical averages. Morbidity is another measure that can be used to evaluate heat impacts, and this refers to illnesses which are measured in terms of hospitalizations, emergency room visits, and uh, or ambulance calls. And here too, the excess measure can be used in order to account for under uh, reports. We used mortality as our metric in this study, and we're currently working on a study focused on evaluating the impact of land cover prescriptions on morbidity. Coming back to our LA study, we decided to treat LA like a patient, in this case, a patient suffering from extreme heat. What would we prescribe to our patient to reduce its heat exposure? We tested combinations of low, medium, and high, but still achievable targets. For example, low tree cover and high albedo of roofs and pavements. We tested these targets against current baseline conditions, and we compared these to four prescriptions combining different doses of tree cover and albedo. Our climatologists, led by Dr. Larry Kalkstein, use an approach called synoptic climatology, which makes a synopsis of various weather conditions. We look at the entire weather situation as a whole rather than correlating more mortality with only temperature or only humidity. There are typical weather situations that stay in an area for a period of time and here, think of a giant bell jar with humid, warm air that is re replaced by a cold front represented by another bell jar. There are about a dozen such air mass types that impact Los Angeles in summer, but there are only two that we're really concerned with, which produce dangerous heat conditions. One is the dry tropical air mass, or DT for short, the hottest of any air masses in LA, occurring during the notorious Santa Ana winds. The moist tropical plus or MT plus for short type brings hot and humid conditions that also produce increased heat related public health impacts. By evaluating the frequencies of these air masses and just focusing on the air masses that we know bring about the bulk of heat related problems, we can identify the impact of heat. Here are the frequencies for a few select cities. In New York, you can see in the first column that 11% of days are either DT or MT plus. This is in the summer. In the next column, we see that on the average DT day, the mortality is 16.6 .6 fatalities above the baseline. So almost 17 additional people die on average on a DT day, which is a 7% increase over a day that is not DT. This is a daily number, which means that the average number of deaths each summer could be well in the hundreds, but it does vary. Some days have very high mortality, some very low. And perhaps surprisingly, we see that there are less heat-related deaths in places like Phoenix, which is consistently hotter and therefore is actually much better adapted, largely because there is little variability in summer. And this is a key point. The higher the variability, the higher the heat vulnerability. 
Now let's consider another question that I'd like you to answer. And again, I'll give our hosts just a moment to get the Mentimeter page back up and running. So again, think about where you live. Think about your city or town. What groups of people in your city or town are most vulnerable to heat? When it's really hot out, who is it that is at highest risk of heat-related impacts where you live? As you think about this question, you might consider factors like age or income or work environment and work condition or perhaps housing condition. I'll give you another few seconds to fill out your response in the Mentimeter and we'll review them shortly. Back to our LA study, we modeled four different types of heat waves based on the DT and MT plus categories, and we evaluated our prescriptions against these. The, the heat waves we looked at included hot and humid, a mix of dry and humid, a less extreme heat wave to see how a more common event might respond, and finally, a very hot Santa Ana type event. And as you can see from the dates, we used observed historical weather data, which we modeled against uh, historical public health data for the same period. Here's what the meteorological modeling looked like, led by Dr. David Saylor at Arizona State University. We broke down the county down into grids, and here we see air temperature differences at a height of two meters for the August 2009 heat wave. The darker the blue, the more cooling is produced under a given prescription. The panels show morning, midday, and evening from left to right. In this prescription, the blue is the darkest in the midday scenario, meaning that we see the best result in the middle of the day with up to one to two degrees Celsius reduction. The arrows show wind flow, and you can see that this prescription actually produces some relative warming for small pockets of the county, and you can see that in the southeast on the right panel. Uh, this is because heat can be displaced from one neighborhood and moved to another. Our bioclimatologists then took the results of this meteorological modeling and then used that to determine how public health outcomes would have fared under these different weather conditions. We did a countywide analysis, which assumed the same prescriptions for the entire area. The advantage there was that we had a large sample to evaluate mortality. The disadvantage was that we couldn't evaluate the results more granularly in that analysis which led us to conduct a second district level evaluation. Our social scientists broke up the county into several districts that are fairly homogenous from a socioeconomic perspective. The advantage was being able to analyze how these various factors might correlate to heat related mortality, though the smaller populations also meant that instances of heat related deaths were smaller, diluting the strength of the analysis relative to the larger countywide evaluation. Here are the districts that we ended up studying for the more granular analysis. We came up with 18 total districts, but reduced them to 11 that were developed around typologies taking into account things like ethnicity, income, and housing density. Virtually all of the 11 districts, except for one which we studied, uh, were considered higher density, uh, low income neighborhoods, where we generally see the burden of heat related illnesses and deaths borne by communities of color. Here's one of the many district level modeling results. For the July 2006 heat wave, under a high canopy and high albedo prescription, we see that many of the districts experience mortality re reductions of 30, 40, and 50% or more, meaning that we have the potential to save many lives if we apply the land cover interventions. Note that we have two districts in gray, the one in the northwest part of the county served as a sort of control. This is a wealthier district where we didn't expect to see much change because many households are already well equipped to withstand hot weather with measures such as higher tree canopy, better insulation and air conditioning. But we did have a surprise with District 10 in the center of the map, which includes working class communities of color. We weren't able to account for this through our modeling 
and we believe that this finding warrants further study. We suspect that there could be social factors at work, as these are predominantly Latino neighborhoods where a strong sense of community may very well yield protection to the worst outcomes during heat waves. But for now, the truth is we don't quite know. We also looked in the future uh, and asked how many years we might be able to delay the warming effects of climate change in LA County. We estimated that the mean reduction in maximum temperatures in the county was between 1 and 1.7 degrees Celsius, depending on the prescription applied. We used average temperatures, uh, the average temperature increases produced by climate models adopted by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for the years 1950 to uh, 2099. And the bars show how many years we could ostensibly delay warming if we were to apply the land cover prescriptions. Let's just take the orange bar with the number 43, which is for our X4, our most progressive land cover prescription. Under the business as usual representative concentration pathway or RCP 8.5, it will take about 43 years to increase the temperature 1.7 degrees C from today's mean temperature. Since we expect a 1.7 degree reduction under our X4, we could thus counter the anticipated warming, delaying it by approximately four decades. If we look at the moderate mitigation scenario under RCP 4.5, we can see that the number of decades of delay are even greater because we will get a combined benefit of reduced emissions and mitigation by land cover prescriptions. In summary, here is what our research found. In terms of temperature, we found that reductions between one and two degrees C were common, which may sound small, but is quite sufficient to save lives. We quantified how many lives we could save and found that under various prescriptions of tree canopy and albedo, reducing heat-related deaths by 25% or more was a common outcome. We also found that we could change weather situations, which is not something our climatologists often see in the work that they do. What this means is that under some of the prescriptions, certain heat waves were shifted from the oppressive DT or MT plus air masses to more benign ones, which can improve public health outcomes. And this is all due to prescriptions that happen on the ground. Finally, we found that these land cover prescriptions could have a quantifiable benefit on delaying or even negating heat impacts of climate change for the region with the scenarios delaying warming by two to six decades. So what does all this mean for implementation? How do we take compelling research and turn it into action? I'll now share with you a few implementation approaches that LA is taking. We're fortunate to have a robust set of entities, including nonprofits and government agencies that are focused on tree planting and care, largely in neighborhoods with lowest tree cover. These programs vary, with some being volunteer-based and others providing workforce development opportunities. In our climate, where we have six or more months of dry weather, perhaps the biggest challenge is providing regular watering for the first few years of a young tree's life. And in LA, to address that, many tree planting campaigns actually involve residents who are asked to help water trees planted in the public right-of-way in front of their homes. In recent years, LA has also taken steps to increase the reflectance of the built environment. The city has been testing different cool street and pavement applications, evaluating reflective products for effectiveness and longevity. Here are some photos of the cool street pilot program, which have been found to reduce surface temperatures by an average of about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. In 2013, LA became the first large city to pass a law requiring all new and redeveloped homes to have a cool roof, an effort that is being expanded currently to other land uses. The city offers a rebate to help pay for retrofitting of those roofs. I've included the photo at the top right to show you that cool roofs that incorporate innovative technologies can actually look just like traditional roofing materials and don't necessarily have to be light in color. Both of these efforts for both the roofing and streets 
Both of these efforts owe their success to partnerships between local government, academia, and nonprofit advocacy organizations. Bold targets and mandates in the city and county sustainability plans are also helping to push implementation. The city has committed to reducing the heat island by three degrees Fahrenheit by 2035 and increasing tree canopy by 50% in areas of greatest need by 2028, when the Olympics will return to LA. The county of LA also has set ambitious targets, both for shading and cooling. But if we're being realistic, we know that achieving these targets is going to be very difficult and will take a great deal of effort. And so to explore and address the barriers to implementation, new roles have been created, including the hiring of a city forest officer in 2018 and an urban forest equity scholar in 2020, a role that was filled by Dr. Vivek Chandas, who presented in part two of this masterclass series and spoke about community engagement in heat mitigation efforts. Through this collaborative effort that Dr. Shandas is helping to lead, LA is studying a tiered tree planting approach to achieve a more equitable distribution of trees and shade. We're quantifying how much we would move the needle if we only planted trees in the first tier, which is in spaces that are already currently available to plant, such as vacant tree wells. But in some neighborhoods to achieve urban forest equity, we know that we will need to plant in tier two spaces, which require site modifications, such as removing concrete or asphalt. In the least shaded neighborhoods, tier three plantings will need to be pursued, which will require more drastic site modifications, such as building bump outs on city streets to provide new planting spaces. This graph shows a generalized cost benefit relationship of these three tree planting tiers with consideration given to the amount of greening produced on the x-axis and the effort and investment required on the y-axis. This assessment will help identify and address the barriers to urban forest equity and provide a prioritization approach to reaching LA's ambitious goals with our limited resources available. And with that, I'd like to thank the Global Heat Health Information Network for inviting me to speak. And I'd also like to thank each of you for your time and your interest. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much.